Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to this session uh, on uh, um, neutrino. Uh, sorry, <laughs> neutron troubleshooting. Um, um, we are um, uh, from uh, Dell EMC, and I'm Nida He here. And this is uh, my colleague uh, Diego and uh, Mohammed. Um, so um, uh, we have been working on a uh, kind of a, a tanky um, solution. Uh, based on uh, OpenStack. It's called the uh, new, uh, VX Rack Neutrino. It, it is actually running live um, here uh, it, uh, at the EMC, uh, the Dell EMC booth. Um, it is a kind of a self-contained uh, mini data center that contains the networking um, storage and, and compute. And for those who of you, uh, for those of you who hasn't um, I uh, have not seen a, a kind of <coughs> a data center in real time. You may want to go there and take a look. Uh, it, it's kind of the rack. Uh, so uh, it, it's the rack and like with, with everything you would need uh, for, for running a mini data center. So I definitely would encourage you guys to go there and take a look. Um, so, um, so here today, um, we're going to kind of, kind of present, go through the presentation uh, in the kind of storytelling mode. And uh, <coughs> um, so um, just, just, to give, just kind of give a quick introduction to all the actors here. Um, I'm uh, Lida He, and I'm the, the one who under the constant pressure to deliver. And uh, also, I, was, I, I won't hesitate to ask you any issues. And uh, here's uh, <coughs> Diego. It's the, uh, the innocent looking Diego who is trying to remain calm on, in all the storms. And we have a uh, Muhammad who is the net network guru who, is, um, <coughs> who knows all the tra tricks and who has all the magic to fix problems. But he also makes fun of us by telling us the stupid user errors. So, <coughs> so here we are today. and. Um, um, we are actually working on a, a, a project called the. Hold on a second. Uh, oops. <laughs> okay. So, well, I can call it on the on the project called the Unicorn. So, but if by any any coincidence that you, you have a new project called Unicorn or have some actors or some uh, employees like us, this is a pure coincidence. Okay. So, um, so mon one mon Monday morning and. Uh, you know, I, I woke up with this dreaded message on my laptop. So, so uh, the first thing I would, do, I would call is to call uh, Diego, which is with the guy on the front line. So, hey, Diego, what's wrong with my uh, server? It's very important to me. Um, you know, go and fix it. You have 10 minutes to fix it. Go work on it as soon as possible. All right, so this is how it starts for all of us in IT. It's Monday morning, I had an awesome weekend. I haven't had my first cup of coffee. And I got this guy here who's going to be impacted by his bonus, dump it all on me. We'll see how that goes. Cut the crap. Go ahead and fix the problem. Oh, he's here. <laughs> um, do we have a ticket before I look at this? Yes, there's a ticket. Every all the details is there. So you have, should have all you need to fix your, uh, the problem. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll get that done. So apparently, as I can see here, the site can't be reached. Uh, this whole unicorn thing has been going for a long time, and uh, they always blame somebody else. So let's, let's just take a look at this for a second. Well, so the basic architecture is what we see here. Um, he's trying to access unicorn from his laptop. So he goes into um, his open stack, uh, tenant and he's just really trying to see if it works or not. Uh, most of the time, this is a user problem, so I, I really won't take a look at this right now. I'm gonna shove the problem to the side. It's probably networking or firewall. It's usually those two groups who cause me problem. Hey, Mohammed, how are you, man? Hey, what's up? You're doing good? I'm fine, how are you doing? Uh, I know Lida is back again with some, some, some drama. Oh, and man. I you know, I'm pretty sure I've checked okay, no, all of OpenStack. Okay, I've looked everywhere. Does he realize that we are in I, I did we not. have work in the summit here? Doesn't he realize that? 
Um, yeah, so he yeah. has a ticket and all that, and uh -huh. I, I think it's somehow related to networking. Do you mind just, you know, driving him and showing him what it is that he needs to look first? Yep, sure. Just, uh, can I have some time just to get to know the, the crowd and know our guests here? Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, so he already introduced us. I just want to get to know you more. Um, I'm going to do that by asking some questions. So please, how many of you think of them as more like network experts than Linux experts? OK, a few hands. And how many of you think the opposite? The other side. The rest, the rest think they are expert in both? <laughs> OK. <laughs> or in none. Or in none. <laughs> it's OK. Uh, so uh, one more question. Uh, how many of you know what is address resolution protocol or ARP? OK. Good, good. Many hands. For, you, for, you, for those of you who don't know, don't worry. I'm going to explain a little bit about it. The reason I'm bringing this here up because we really need to know the foundation uh, before going into more uh, details and more uh, advanced stuff. And, and basically, ARP is one of the basic TCP IP uh, protocols that you should know about. OK, so if you have uh, a network, well, uh, you have three hosts here, hosts A, B, and C, all on the same layer to span. And I, I, uh, I uh, I draw, I draw two lines under layer two here because ARP is used for uh, when you want when you have your host on, on layer two, so they are on the same subnet, and and host A wants to communicate with host B in this example, so host A is going to send a broadcast request, broadcast ARP request. It's going to reach host B and host C, and then host C will not respond because he doesn't have the IP address that host A wants to reach, which is 192.168.1.2 in this example. But host B does have it. So host B says, hey, it's me, and my MAC address is, is this. So he sends it back to host A. Now host A will, will start building what we call the MAC address table, or, or what we call the, the ARP table. Uh, somebody, some, some people like to call it ARP table. So now uh, host A has uh, 192.168.1.2, which is IP of host B, and the MAC address of host, of host B. So things, things, are, things will be nice, and host A is going to be able to. OK, so now that I know you, <laughs> let's get back to, to the problem. Well, so finally. <laughs> I have to my patience. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no patience here. So, So here's Lida on the right and the unicorn application uh, on the left. Um, the IP of Lida, I want you to, to, to memorize this, try to memorize these IPs because you're going to see them uh, in this case all along. So Lida's IP is 10.252.72.99, and he's trying to reach, to reach floating IP at 10.246.155.239. There's no conflict here in this IP. This IP is uh, range 20, 20, uh, 16, and that IP is, is, uh, is 24. Okay. So first thing to look for, I um, forgot to mention something. Uh, here, we, uh, in our architecture, we, have, we are using uh, distributed virtual routing, uh, which means that the, the networking piece is, it goes along with the, with the instance. So when you, when you launch your instance, let's say it's launched on, on host A, the networking for that is going to be on host A, uh, for the, uh, especially when we're talking about uh, floating IPs. So here we have to find on which cloud compute is my instance hosted. To do that, uh, you can do Nova list, uh, and then you, no, you do Nova show. Uh, the instance name and grab for host, and here you can find what is your host name. Okay, next. Here you can see an overview of uh, of how uh, of what network components uh, are are involved in in this uh, kind of packet flow. So, so we have Lida in the external, 
outside of our cloud who wants to reach something on, in the cloud in the internal uh, uh, on the floating IP uh, for his application unicorn. So an overview of the architecture, Lida will first hit the OVS external bridge on the BRX interface. He will then Okay, it's external, it's internal. Here is LIDA. He goes to the external bridge, and then after that, uh, it, he will go to the floating, floating IP namespace. Just a note for people who already know this architecture, uh, we have done some plumbing, so we changed the FG port from the integration bridge, uh, so we don't go through the integration bridge, we don't go directly from the external bridge to the floating IP namespace. It, it's not relevant to our discussion here, but just as a, as a side note. Um, I'm gonna explain more about each component as we go on, but I want you to, to know how the flow goes and then I'll go on to each component. So from the floating IP namespace, which acts as a regular router with, an, with a special functionality to, to do proxy ARP. We talked about ARP, you remember? So here, uh, the reason we use floating IP um, namespace and then we use the Q router to the left is because we don't want to, to, to waste uh, our floating IP. So we need, so we give on the, float, on the router, we give slash 32 subnet uh, and then on the, on the floating IP namespace, uh, we, we configure uh, uh, our floating IP range so that it responds to the ARP, ARP request on behalf of the Q routers. And this, this helps us in, in reserving uh, float, floating IPs or else we wouldn't need uh, an additional device just to do routing, so we have two routers. And then we go to the, uh, to the Q router, which we, and here we, we, we will talk about it more later. And then to the integration bridge, the, the Linux kernel bridge, and then we can reach the floating IP of our instance, or, or the instance. Okay, just to, to make this uh, more visual, um, I've drawn a diagram like of a physical uh, physical network. So basically, all you can see, all you see here are on the same host, right? From starting from the external switch, external uh, the OVS external bridge is just a switch connected to our external router, and then from there it's connected to the to the uh, to the floating IP router, and then to another router it's called Q router. And the Q router is the one that you see in Horizon when you create your project and then you create uh, uh, your router. This is the one that you see. The FIP, the FIP router you don't see in Horizon. It's in the system. Um, and then the integration switch. J I'm sorry, just a la layer two switch. And then you have the, li the, the Linux uh, kernel switch to the left. And here I said layer two, layer three switch plus firewall because the reason we, we use uh, use the Linux bridge because it's just because the integration switch cannot access the, the Linux uh, IP tables kernel and cannot, cannot use this. And we, we need that for security groups that you configure in Horizon or, or for, for your project. Okay, so let's go now and see each component individually. First, we're going to start with the external bridge. And for people who are not following or who feel that this is very complex, just, just don't leave the room <laughs> because we, we, you're going to learn some, some tricks and some commands on the way so you can take something out of this. So first thing to learn is TCP dump. How many of you would know TCP dump or have used it before? Hey, wow, that's good, great. Okay. Make sure you always remember to use it and have it, have it along when you're troubleshooting networking. I like to use some switches like a minus N for not resolving uh, uh, so that I, I see only the IP address. I don't want to see the host names because I know IP addresses. The minus E uh, to show my, the MAC address, I like to always turn this on. And you then specify your interface and the um, routing protocol. So Lida, do you mind running a continuous ping for me? From your instance to the... I've been uh, pinging all the all time since the in the morning. You're still pinging, yeah, right? Yeah, still pinging. Sure. Waiting for it to come <laughs> back. Don't ask. Don't <laughs> ask guy. All right. So I'm, I'm going to go into the external bridge. Not moving to the right. Not moving anywhere. Okay. 
Okay. Can you see this clear? Okay. So here, here I, I SSH into the uh, the node that I just found that uh, my, my where where my instance is located, because all my troubleshooting is going to take place there. And it happens that it's on a Docker container, so I have to go into this, into the Docker container of the where she, where the Nova compute is hosted. If I do obvious yes control show, which is a, an obvious command. I can see a lot of interfaces. We will learn later how, how, how to know which interface to use. So here, I, first thing, because this is an external uh, traffic, the first thing it's going to hit is the BRX interface. So if I do uh, a TCP dump on the ICMP protocol, I can see that I have this, this source IP that I showed you from LIDA trying to re uh, having a, sending an ICP request to the floating IP, but I don't see the reply, right? We don't have a reply here, so. So next, let's see uh, if, if we are, if, let's go to the next step. Yeah, I have to close this. It's very small here. Okay, so next step, I have to check if, uh, if the, uh, uh, traffic is, is actually hitting the FG interface. FG stands for Floating IP Gateway, so, it, so it's the gateway uh, that it should hit. So I go into, uh, and here, here before, yeah, before I forget, uh, how many of you know what is the Linux namespace, network namespace? Cool, good. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, Linux namespace is a, net, is a Linux kernel feature that allows you to, uh, to isolate uh, resources and, uh, and processes. And uh, in particular here, uh, if you're talking about Neutron, it allows us to, uh, to separate uh, the IP routing table and the IP table and the IP table uh, features. And uh, how many of you, uh, I already explained what is a floating IP namespace, so do you all know now what is a floating IP namespace? Okay. So again, it's, it, it will respond to proxy. It's only a router. Its role is to respond to, to ARP requests on behalf of, of the queue router. And um, the floating IP namespace is connected to the queue router uh, using point-to-point -point connection from uh, so as you see on the right, FPR, sort of floating, uh, floating FIP to router, and then to the left, router to FIP on the queue router. So it's just a point-to-point -point connection. Here you'll, run, you'll, you'll learn to run this command, IP route get. Here I am trying to get where is, the, uh, where is my floating IP. Uh, if I want to go to, fly, to my floating IP, how, how is this uh, namespace going to route me? And it's important to know this command. The reason it is, you, you have, it's important to know this command, and it's important to know the architecture here. Because if you are, uh, if you are uh, running this, you will, and you see that it's routing to somewhere you're not expecting, you will know that there's an issue here, and I should, I should, uh, I should check what's going on with my routing table. So I go into this router. I list my namespaces. We have only one floating IP namespace because it's the only one responding to all the uh, proxy ARP requests. And with IP net and S execute and the, the ID of the namespace, I can see this FG interface uh, which responds to the ARP requests on behalf of the queue routers. And I can see the, P2, the P2P connection, the point-to-point -point connection with the, uh, with the, B, with the BRX. Uh, so I, if I do a TCP dump inside this namespace on this interface, the, the, floating, the floating area interface, ICMP, I'm, I'm going to see the same, uh, the same result as before with no replies. So now I should check where is this, uh, this uh, router or namespace uh, 
thinks that it should go next. So I do IP route get, and I specify the IP address of my uh, floating IP, 10.246.155.239. And you can see it's going to the point-to-point -point interface uh, to the queue router. So let's see if it's going out of this interface. I do a TCP dump on this interface. And indeed, it's going out of this interface. OK. OK, let's get rid of that. Next, I go to the, my, my Q router namespace. And here, some magic is happening. So uh, all the way, we have been saying that um, the request is coming from leader's IP to the floating IP. But here, on the RFP interface, we're going to see the same. But after that, we have, an IP, we have IP tables, and we have NATing configured here. Everybody knows what is NATing. OK. So it's NATing is going to translate the destination. In the, in the IP packet, it will look the, at the destination IP address, which it, it will find here that it's a floating IP. And it will translate it to something else. It will translate it to the private IP that you had specified for your instances when you, when you launched your instance. And after the IP table, when it finishes this translation, then it will look at the routing table. So it will do the translation, and then it will look at the routing table. This is very important to know. OK, so if I go into this router. Always, yeah, can you do that for me? Now you need my help? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I need more hands on that. Just click on the router. Yes, sir. Thank you. So here, uh, I, I recommend to always name your, your devices. So here, I have named my router as the Summit. So I grab the ID for this router, and then I attach to it uh, the, the keyword key router and the ID. So here I grab, I grab it in the IP NetNS command, and then I attach. You can find it by attaching the key router and the router ID here. OK, so now let's see if I'm getting the request on the point-to-point uh, -point connection between my floating IP namespace and my crew router. First, I, I list the interfaces. And you'll notice that the RFP interface and the, and the FPR interface have the same ID. It's just the first three letters are switched. So I do the TC, same TCP dump. I still see uh, the same, the same uh, result as before. Uh, the, uh, it's going to the floating IP. So I will check. What, what does it have in the routing table for the floating IP? And you'll notice something weird here that it's, it's, it, will, it will show you that it's sending the, uh, it, it, it thinks that it should send to its loopback interface. You see it dev LO. So what's happening here? What's happening is that now the translation is taking place before the routing. So if I look up my, my IP table, I will see that in the pre-routing pre chain, so it's a pre-routing, this is a very important, you know, the, the floating IP is being, is being translated into the private IP. And this is happening before, the route, before, the, before we look up in the routing table. So now I should, I should actually be looking for the private IP instead of the floating IP. And when I do that, I find that it's going out of the QR interface. The QR interface is the gateway that your instances are connected to. So if I do, uh, if I show, if I do IPA show, then I can specify one interface. I will show, I will see the, uh, that this is a default gateway. It's on the same subnet as my private, private IPs. And all my instances, if they need to go outside, they need to connect to this gateway. So 
So I'm going to do a TCP dump here to see if, if I'm getting anything different on this interface. So you will notice here a different result than before. So here, the leader's IP is still the same because the source doesn't change. What changes is destination. Destination now is a private IP. It's no, it's no longer the floating IP that he was trying to access. And this is normal. So far, everything is good. So what is the next? So now, next, this Q router is going to send uh, the packet to the integration bridge and from the integration bridge to the Linux bridge. I'm not going to go into the integration bridge. The reason is it's just acting as a layer two switch. Nothing, nothing very special happening here. The reason we have two, two switches is because the OVS cannot have IP tables. And we need IP tables in the, here to, to have the security groups. When you configure security groups, uh, you block one port, you open one port, it's only the Linux bridge that has access to this. So, and here, here I, you will learn how to identify this port, the tab port connected to the instance, because you saw that we have many, many instances. So, so I'll teach you how to identify this port, this tab interface. So if we open. If we can find the mouse, yeah. Oh, here he is. I track that mouse. <laughs> so, so running the OVS VS control, you need to do show. You see a lot of interfaces, and if you do IPA, it even gets worse. So it's, it's really overwhelming. So how do I know which interface I'm connecting to? So if I go and do Nova list and then I do Nova show on my instance, I will find the instance ID. See the instance ID in yellow? If you do then verse, which is a KVM, uh, KVM command, verse list, you see attached to it uh, ID 76. There's another KVM command, verse dom if list, and then I put the IP of my uh, of my of my uh, of my uh, interface, and here here you go. Here's the here's the interface name. So let's do a TCP dump here, and we can do it straight on the host because it's a Linux kernel. It's on, on the Linux bridge. So we do we do a TCP dump, and the same result uh, as before. It's going to the private IP. The request, but no reply. So let's see. Let's see if we are getting anything back. So we are sure that we are sending you to the answer. So let's see if we're getting anything. I change the TCP dump filter. I do source host. So I see if I'm getting anything back from my instance at 10.52.33.99. And hey, indeed. Can you stop this here? So my instance is asking is asking everybody on the layer two domain, which is the Linux bridge and the OVS integration bridge. So who do we have there? So we know that we have our Q router there. But do we have leaders, uh, do we have leaders IP there? So, so now the, the, the request is getting to the instance, but the instance needs to reply back. So it looks, it, it's, it has to know the IP address because for, for the instance, for the instance, the IP of leader is is on the same subnet as can you run? Is, is on the same subnet as uh, as the inst as the private IP. For this reason, it thinks that it should send a, an ARP request to know who has it on this layer two domain. Who has this IP? It's asking who has this IP. So here, hey Lida, do you have this IP? This is IP. It's your IP. Looks like it. Well, no, no? it's not because no? from the point of no? view of the instance. This IP doesn't exist. This, nobody is replying to this IP. Is it you, Diego? I don't I'm know. just kidding. It's not you. It's not Diego's IP. Maybe it's the Q router IP. So again, this is from the point of view of the instance. She's trying to look where where is this IP. Nobody is responding. Is it instance B? No. The Q router? No. Well, guess what? 
it's nobody's IP. From the point of view of the instance, nobody has this IP. On this layer two domain, nobody has it. So what, what happened? What, what caused this issue? I can exit of this and, and run the Just close the, we don't need it anymore. So, on the right, you see Lida's IP is 10.52.72.99.16, and he was always trying to reach the floating IP, but he didn't realize that his private IP was from the same range as his, as, as his IP on his laptop. Because he thinks that if he, doesn't, if he doesn't have a conflict with his floating IP, then it's okay. But from the point of view of the, uh, of the instance, it needs to reply back. And it thinks that anything between the range of 10.52.0.0 .0 .0 and 10.52.255.255 255 is considered connected in the same layer to domain. So it just sends on the left side an ARP request, and it doesn't get any reply back. So it thinks that nobody has IP and keeps sending and never, to never be able to reply back to reader. What happened here? Okay. <laughs> um, so, see, always, always be careful when you're configuring your subnets. Okay, Lida. <laughs> so, I'm shooting myself in the foot. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> Yeah, that was expected. Well, thank you. Um, it looks like that solved my problem temporarily. Good. But, we're, uh, we're good? Well, later in the day, I'm trying to move some files, some files between my VMs. I can't. So here I go. What happened? Okay. Another problem in the same day? Oh, yeah. what, what are you trying to do? I'm trying to move files between two servers. I can't. Trying to copy files. Okay. Um, can you ping them? In the ticket, everything can work looking for me. The connectivity is fine. All right. I just so, cannot move it. Yeah, <laughs> let's, let's cut the drum of this guy because this is derailing really fast. So let me go ahead and check what's going on here. So we have here an overview of his architecture. You see the web and a DB. And right now, he's doing a copy, an SCP, between the web and the DB that we have there. So those are now using only private IPs. We're not hitting any floating IP anymore. And they're sitting um, in different machines. So we'll see that in a second. So yes, Bing works. Um, so it's not really my problem, my buddy. So you go ahead and troubleshoot it. Just kidding, before he escalates again. So Wait. Bing does work. Uh, but for some reason, SCP does not work. You can SSH, but you can't really do much. Okay, just keep that in mind for now. Oh, wait a second, I just talked to this guy. Come here, just take a look at this. Fine. So Lida sent an email to all sales, all top management and all IT, saying that once again, IT cannot deliver. Oh my God, this is in danger. Didn't we just solve this problem? I mean, I just talked to him like five minutes ago. This is embarrassing. Oh, no. oh my phone will be ringing in a second. Hold on a second. Make sure this is on airplane mode. <laughs> Let's drop that too. All right, I don't want this anymore. Have this happened to you? No, it's okay. You're not on camera, so you can raise your hand. So a little explanation of the instance. Um, we have the web instance running on one side, and we have the DB on the other side. And you can tell um, they should be able to just talk to each other through uh, this private address space. So that's Unicorn, essentially. Uh, a true instance application, in, in our example here, sitting on different compute nodes connected by an underlay network. So we're traversing the physical network. Uh, we're going through um, a router or an L3 device. And on top of that, we have a tunnel uh, on the overlay uh, network. 
A really common scenario would be to use something like VXLAN tunnels. You can also do it with GRE and some others. Uh, in our example uh, with VXLAN, if you were to get that picture before with the boxes and the network, and if you were to peel that off, this is what you would have. Uh, this here, it's pretty much what Mohammed was showing before, but now we have um, a traffic moving from one side to the other, so between instances or east to west in network lingo. And it's going through various places. But essentially, we're now going down the VX land tunnels. So if you look at the picture, it is extremely overwhelming, even for folks with a lot of baggage networking to say it's happening here and you go we take a look unless you've done it before in your own environment and you know some uh, over time I guess we know some of the usual suspects and you go and just check them so what we're gonna do since it's essentially uh, mirroring here and we know that we can think let's chop half of the picture in the diagram and let's just take a look at that for a second so we'll focus on this side for now um, but that applies to the other side too, as once we're getting um, through the, um, the troubleshooting. So first, let's just take a quick look at the tunnel bridge. So if you come to the tunnel bridge, you'll be able to run um, some of the open vSwitch commands, uh, essentially what Mohammed uh, showed before, to display all of the ports. And you'll also be able to see in each one of these interfaces, the endpoints, so you can do initial troubleshooting in there. So if you don't have this, you would have a problem here. Now, I don't think this is a problem right now because I can ping, I can SSH, so it's probably not here. So let's just move along a little bit. So the next thing that we have to take a look is the Linux bridge, what's happening in there. There's various little components that could be um, in place. If we do a BRCTL and then we do the show the max, we see that we're actually learning. So we're okay on that front as well. Now, I do a show STP and I see also that everything is in order. It's forwarding, I don't, I don't seem to have a problem in here. The next obvious place for us uh, to take a look at would be in the instance itself. Um, as we go inside of the instance, we can definitely ping from there as well, so we can see that. And to verify um, that could be something else, I just did an if config. Um, I don't see anything out of the ordinary getting out of here. So this leads me to think that you know it's it's gotta be um, it's gotta be something else. So let's try to troubleshoot this as a group. Do you guys think this could be something like an IP tables in the user land? running in the instance? Anybody thinks it could be a firewall issue? Somehow, like a rate limit or something? No? Okay. How about we say a security group? Maybe? Okay. Did I heard MTU? MTU? Right. You've been there before, right? <laughs> so the aha moment that we just had. So if you take a look back on this, it might be a bit hard to see on the screen, so I'll zoom in. Does that MTU look correct to you guys, 1500? It is, it is if it's physical. If it's physical or it's, if it's not OpenStack and there's no VXLAN. Now that number, my friends, that is the magic number here. So what number should that be, Mohammed? Yeah, exactly. So we saw that at 1,500 is normal everywhere. Like before OpenStack, nobody configured less than that. Like we had physical hosts or, or, or virtual machines everywhere. Uh, you can configure 1,500. But once you introduce the VXLAN tunnel, it, it, it adds on top of the packet 50 bytes, 50 bytes. And that's that, if it's 1,500, it will become 1,550 when it's talking with the, with the next hop. The next hub doesn't agree on that and, and start dropping packets. Now, why, is, why does ICMP work? They go. Well, so smaller packets will be fine, but once you try something else, then you start having some issues. Now, if we go back to this and we change that, and that's how it should look like, a normal behavior would be you spin it up an instance 
and then once the instance gets the request from the HCP, you'll be all set, and you won't have that. There are very few scenarios where this could be happening. Now, knowing that, you can just change with if config, and that's what I did, just to test. And then you can see that the SCP works right away. Before, it would stall, and then it would stop. So first you change, and then, uh, of course, I ran SCP to confirm that the issue is actually gone now. So you're all clear. There is no more drama necessary. You can go ahead and, and launch Unicorn. Oh, cool. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, looks like I did shoot myself in the foot. <laughs> um, by the way, I'm not that bad uh, in real life. So. <laughs> <laughs> I take my hat off to this guy. He's just so, acting humble here. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. just, just wrap up, and, and so you can tell upper management what's happening. <laughs> Uh, we had two incidents. Number one would be what we are calling the clash of subnets. So think about this. Um, and this could probably work here too. As we have a real environment, we have a rack in, sitting in here. Um, I don't think if you, if you were using one of your laptops here and you get an IP address that conflicts with some of the workload that we have in our current OpenStack here at the summit, you would probably find yourself with case number one. So when, when we have private, uh, clouds, that's something that we have to keep in mind. The number two, um, I really enjoy this. I a lot of hands up for that. I think a, a lot of us uh, old school will see the 1500 MTU and what, a, what MTU can cost you. So something to watch out. And then as we go deeper to understand this, because it makes no sense. I mean, why, why would that happen at all? Well, so it happens that Unicorn, uh, which is a Super cool next generation hipster because, application. Uh, just one comment here. It's, it's not normal because when you have OpenStack and running DHCP, by default, the configuration that DHCP will push to the instance is going to be 1450. So something went wrong here. Somebody like manually configured this, or like some, some developer from the old school came and said, oh, this is 1500. Why, 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 why should it be 1450? Like, they didn't know what they are the consequences. That's right. right. Yeah, that's right. And then what happened is they're doing this CI CD pipeline, and then DD, one of the devs, just put a hit template uh, with the subnets. So there we have the clash of the subnet. He just put that in there. And also to make his life easier as well, and he's using hit, he created an image where he hard coded uh, the 1500. So, you know, he set it up the interface to have that. Uh, you got a picture of DD. That's the last known picture of him. <laughs> <laughs> um, to wrap up a little bit, we, we've talked about two scenarios. Um, we kind of have to rush a little bit through it and went through all of the different layers that we had. So external uh, to internal, north to south, and network lingo. And again, make sure that uh, you understand this. Now we're, we're, we're having a private cloud, so extra thoughts on that process. And then an instance to instance, or you know, east to west, where the MTU played a role in there. Uh, to learn a little bit more, I think some of us will be found to know that uh, we're still mentioning TCP IP Illustrated from Stevens. Uh, it has been the Bible for a lot of us. Uh, it's still highly recommended. Learning OpenStack uh, networking, excellent source of information as well. well we've put out a few of the um, RFCs that uh, essentially we've, we've uh, mentioned here or consulted at, at one place or another and a few of the Linux man pages. Uh, this slides and, and a few of the diagrams that we have, we're going to be publishing on the website that we have uh, for uh, VxRec. So feel free to go and, and, and fetch those out. And as a bonus, we will also be um, delivering this mm -hmm. in the website. So the full left to right with all of the boxes and all that. Um, I have that on an XML format, so you can actually change the layers and, and modify, so you don't have to redo all of that. So it's, um, it's read and write, so you can, you can enjoy that with the commands that apply to the different places. Uh, so you might um, you know, improve that as, as you go as well with your team. A little bit of extra bonus tips, some of the commands, you have that on the slide as well. And let me see if we have, I don't think we have time for QA. Um, we're kind of running short on time. But maybe we can take a few questions here. 
Sure. So do we have any questions? Yes, do you mind? There's a microphone right here. Do you mind coming to the microphone? And just for the guys leaving, we have a raffle. So if you want to stay, and there's some, uh, there, there's a little gift in here as well. Hello. Yes, sir. Uh, just my question is um, to avoid uh, scenario two, maybe if you enable on all the, um, the path a Jumbo frame, you will not have this problem. A what? If you enable Jumbo frame along the path, the old paths, you would not have the problems with the MTU. So I'll, I'll repeat the question. Uh, if you enable Jumbo frame throughout all the path, you wouldn't have that problem. Yeah, yeah. so uh, you would have to reconfigure your physical uh, yeah. devices. Exactly. That's a good point. As well as the VXLAN tunnel yeah. as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Do we have another question? Maybe we can take a couple of extra questions. All right. All right. So. Rough, all right. Well, thank you. Uh, we are on booth A1. Uh, we'll take more questions there if you guys want. If you want to see the thank mini you. data center, which is uh, VXREC Neutrino, please come and join us, and um, we'll, we'll talk there. Thank you very much. For the raffle. For the lucky one. All right, so. One or two? What are we? Oh, man, only one? Uh, two, six, three. It's a Bluetooth uh, uh, hey, speaker. Hey, 263, it's there, over there. Yeah, hey, there you go. Give him a gun.